Thanks for joining us at Discovery Church Online. If you have any questions or want to learn more about who we are as a church, check us out online by going to ilovediscovery.church. You can stay connected anywhere you go with our Discovery Church app. It's free from wherever you download your apps from. Today, we start a brand new message series called Ghosts of Christmas Past. For many people, the most wonderful time of the year isn't so wonderful. A painful past or our own insecurities can haunt us and can overshadow the joy we're supposed to be feeling during Christmas. Today, our senior pastor, Jason Hanish, will be helping us learn how we can be healed and how we can overcome our ghost of Christmas past. freaky. <laughs> hey, man. No. So glad you guys are here. Welcome to Discovery Church. Man, we're beginning this brand new series called Ghosts of Christmas Pass. How many of you are like me when it's like Thanksgiving is over or maybe when December first hits, you start to like um, dive into all of the Christmas classic movies. Anyone out there like me love Christmas? All the Christmas classics. Am I the only Christmas buff here? How many of you like a, like a few of us? Okay. A few. Yeah, I mean, you got to watch all the, and this one comes from the title here, it comes from A Christmas Carol, and so this is a play on this, like, Ghost of Christmas Past. What I believe God wants to do in this series, you guys, is finally deal with some of these things that we've allowed to haunt us in our past, and that in this season here of Christmas time, it's supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year for very many people. I've had, my calendar gets full of people who are hurting during the season. And the suicide rate, it's statistically true, suicide rates are more in December than in all other months combined. Um, there's more suicides. And that's just because people are, they're not experiencing more problems and more issues. They're just feeling it more. It's, it's they're being haunted by their past. And uh, I was thinking about this as a kid. You know, we, my, I grew up with older siblings. I'm the second youngest of seven. And so they would often show me movies that I wasn't supposed to necessarily watch before it was my turn or time or season to watch it. And so they were showing me things like, you know, Halloween and, you know, with Michael Myers and you know, Friday the 13th and these kind of things, which you watch them now and you're like, this is so cheesy, right? You laugh at the stuff now. It's like, this is so weird. It's, it's, but, but then it was scary as man. It's, and I remember having like sleepless nights. How many of you ever did? Like, like watch the movie you shouldn't have watched too early as a kid, and you're in bed, and the lights are all off, and, and you start imagining things, right? Like your mind is playing tricks on you. Like you're, you're developing silhouettes like someone's there in my room or something, and you just start seeing things. And, and as a kid, I ain't getting up and looking at it. I'm not investigating anything. I'm putting that cover over them, and I just, just you know, fall asleep afraid. Um, as an adult, though, it's maybe not like ghosts and apparitions and things, but, but still, there's, there's, there's a little bit of that, that fear. My wife, she's so funny. Like, she's a light sleeper. Any little noise. You know, a little cat walking on the fence out in the backyard or something. Jason, did you hear that? I'm like, and it takes me a while to get me up. She's like shaking me and stuff, slapping me, and I'm like a rock. Unless, unless the alarm goes off, I go into like protective mode or something. But other than that, I am out. So she's shaking me up and like, what's, the, J Jason, you know, is it? I, what, what, did you hear that? What? You hear what? I don't hear, I hear nothing. Someone, someone's in the living room, right? I think, hey, how many, am I the only, only one husbands? Husbands, you, wives, you know, someone, I think someone's out there. I think someone's outside. Or, or you go check, go check. And I gotta, I gotta get up, and I gotta, I gotta go check, and, and every time, turn on the light, what happens? <laughs> Nothing's there. Nothing, I haven't caught the ghost yet. I haven't caught... Or the burglar, or nothing, every time. Every, there's just nothing's there. What I believe God, look, I, I, what I believe is happening is that we are haunted by our past, and, and we are like kids hiding in our bed, and we're covering up the blankets, and we're, we're laying there in fear with shame and regret and in guilt, and, and, and God is going, and this is what God wants to do in this series and today. He wants to begin something new in your life. He's saying, there's nothing there. 
Like you're afraid it's not real. It's not a reality. That can't hurt you anymore. What you need to do is just get up, get up, go turn on the lights. Go shine some light. You'll see nothing, nothing is there. Um, well, I'm going to dig into a person today in the Bible, a person of the Bible named Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet. Yeah, yeah. I thought someone was going to do it. No? Tell it. No veggie tales here? Okay. Well, Jeremiah was a, he was a prophet, and, and he, he, he basically, has, as a prophet, he spoke on behalf of God. Like, God would, he would hear from God and then speak to the people uh, what God shared. But, but in Jeremiah, what was going on was God was, he was hearing the message of God, but, but he really, in his heart, had a hard time believing it himself. And so he struggled with that. He's, he actually wrote this entire book called Lamentations. The entire book is a lament. It is a, a, just a, like a crying out, a complaint letter to God where, where he's going, God, I hear you. You're like, you're, that you're, you're good and you're going to do good things. But God, I have a hard time believing it. I have a hard time experiencing joy in this, because, and so let's pick it up right there in Lamentations chapter 3. Let's hear some of Jeremiah's lament. He says, I want you to notice right away the first two words. He says, I remember. He says, God, that's why. I've written this whole book and prophecies and these wonderful things, and you're going to rescue God's people. We're going to talk about one of the verses. Jeremiah is popular, and you know this verse where God says he wants to give you hope and a future. I mean, Jeremiah is going, look, I know, God, that you, you're going to rescue your people. You're going to give them hope and a future, and you're awesome. But the truth is, God, I remember that that didn't really work out the way that I thought it was. I, I, what I remember, God, is not hope, but I remember my affliction, he says. I remember my wanderings. I remember the bitterness and the gall. I'm not really happy, God. And then he goes on to say, I well remember them like like I, I i it's still fresh in my mind like it just happened yesterday i remember them well and my soul is depressed I, i'm depressed about it i'm downcast on the inside god every time i think about my past i just it's kind of it's kind of hard for me to believe god and experience the joy that I'm supposed to be experiencing so this message today is dedicated to everyone who would say jason i love the messages I just have a hard time believing it because I remember too much. I remember too much of, of what has happened. And, and I want you to write down three things today that Jeremiah remembered from his past. I'm calling them the ghosts from your past. I think there are three things that you can probably identify with that you can kind of relate to Jeremiah, these three things. He used three different words. The first word he used where he said, I remember, he said, I remember my affliction." is what he said. I remember my affliction. Now, before you write it down, I want you to know about this word called aff affliction. The old, your Old Testament was written in the, in the Hebrew, but the Hebrew language is a very descriptive pictorial. It's like a pictorial language. And so when translating it into English, it's really hard because sometimes the one, English, the one Hebrew word could be a paragraph with even pictures and mental images attached to it. Their language is so, so complex. What this word affliction, what Jeremiah is saying is, I remember my affliction comes from an Assyrian root or Assyrian word that means listen to this torture but it was a specific form of torture the picture of it was this the Assyrian form of torture with this word affliction is the the specific torture of being what they would do is they would tie their prisoners or the people being tortured up to a post a big like pole a post and they would tie their hands around it lean them up against it and what they would do is they would one by one they would bring these giant rocks these giant boulders, and they would just place them up against the person tied up on the pole, leaned up this boulder up against him and, and, and the post. And they would just go get another one, one by one, and circle it around them, one at a time, one at a time, until one after the other. It just eventually created this, this Christmas tree-looking pyramid that literally you died of pressure. You were crushed to death. And Jeremiah uses this language. He says, I just, I remember my affliction. I remember God. There was, it wasn't like hope and future. It was this problem and then this problem and then this issue and then that financial struggle and then that relational and then and just one right after the other. God, I just, I, I remember the pressure is what I remember. 
Write it down this way. This is one of the ghosts that can come and haunt you during this season, and it haunted, haunted Jeremiah, is this, personal tragedy. We remember maybe those tragic circumstances, and, and these are terrible events that occur in the world for which there is no blame at all. They just happen. I was reading just this last week about some just crazy events that happen. They're just, they're just tragic. There was one I read about a, a, a husband, or no, it was a, it was a guy proposing to a woman, and he wanted to do it in the fountain, so he steps in the fountain with her to propose, and they get electrocuted to death, okay? It's like, geez, and then, or, or, you know, I'm talking to different people even throughout the week, losing their husband. Someone, a, a, a newlywed, trying to have a family, and they lose their, their firstborn, and, and just, just tragic circumstances. Listen, it, and, and you have to deal with these things, yeah, there's, there, is a, there is a natural process of grief and hurt and, and dealing with that. But if you never arrive, please listen, if you never arrive to the place of acceptance, if you never, begin, if you never just accept it and trust God in it, you're going to arrive at a, at a very dark place. It's worse than just depression and sadness. You're, write it down this way. You're going to arrive at a place of doubt and distrust. And what I'm talking about here is towards God. You see, because sometimes we take these tragic circumstances and what we think is, you know what? Um, God, yeah, he's, he's either all powerful and doesn't care very much because this tragedy happened, this circumstance happened. He's either powerful but just doesn't care about me or the other way. I mean, he's caring, he cares about me, but he doesn't have power to do anything about it. And so we begin to doubt God or distrust him. And why this is so tragic for us even be, is because if you can't trust God, you'll never trust anybody in life. If you can't trust God, you, this will manifest in your relationships and you will be a, just a distrustful person. So that's one of the things Jeremiah says. One of the ghosts that visited him was personal tragedy. And then he says, my wanderings. Here's the second ghost that we can be visited from our past that can haunt us. And that is personal failures. Our personal failures. Ghosts of this sort are, they're painful times caused by our own doing the wrong choices we made in life maybe we said yes to some drugs that we 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 drank too much and then we drove and we you know something happened that we wish would have never happened or maybe you got you got too hot and angry and you did something out of a fit of rage you hurt someone close to you that or you you said something you shouldn't have said but you you said it anyway it happened and and because of your choices now there are relationships that you have to live with that are forever severed you like you've lost people you've lost things there has been failures and because of those consequences you're haunted by them and again if you don't deal with these if never we deal with them it'll create regret and guilt we'll be consumed with in our life and the dampen to dampen the pain of and, and self-hatred we build up defense mechanisms and we don't allow people just to get close to us anymore personal failures personal tragedy the here's the third ghost that we can be visited by from our past and that is relational wounds jeremiah just said i remember the bitterness uh this is a big one because we live in a world of imperfect people. These are wounds that we receive from people. May, may, deliberately, where someone lied about you, someone stabbed you in the back, somebody, you know, they, they talked about you, they deceived you, and this can happen in every, in every sphere of relationship. It can happen in your marriages, it can happen in your friendship, it can happen in the workplace. And yes, it can happen in church because there's imperfect people everywhere. This kind of hurt, when you don't deal with it, it'll, it'll create bitterness and vengefulness. It will just become bitter and vengeful. It'll provoke this desire for every one of us to want to get revenge, this tendency to want them to suffer the same way that, that I suffered. And these types of relational wounds can hurt us deeply. And if, and if left unresolved, it can manifest itself in unexpected ways at unexpected times. But you need to understand something today. Please listen, you guys. When, when you hold on to your history, you do it at the expense of your destiny. Are you hearing me today, guys? Okay. When you, when you hold on to your history, when you don't deal with those things properly, you do it at the expense of your destiny. So what do we do with this? What do we do when we're visited by the ghosts of our past? You got about four choices. 
is what I've kind of narrowed it down to. You've got about four choices, four responses of how you're going to deal with your past. And you deal with them probably in one of these four ways. Write them down. What do we do with our past? Number The first way that a lot of us try to do is we try to bury it. We just try to bury that thing. Just try to, you just, you know, get it out of sight, get it out of mind, sweep it under the rug. Uh, you can wreck your future by running from your past. You know that? You can wreck it. You can totally, and some of you might be letting a dark past ruin a bright future. And we think that if we just bury this, if I can just get it out of sight, time, let time, time go by and, and, and it'll be better. It's not. Time does not heal. Only the Holy Spirit can heal you. And so we, we try to sweep it under the carpet. We'll put it in the closet. We'll put that skeleton in the closet. I'm telling you, that skeleton will come back to haunt you because it never really goes away. It never really goes away. You have to let it be healed because you will always be haunted by what you don't heal. That is actually why it's coming back, resurrecting in your life, affecting you. Uh, it's because you're not healed. Let me say it this way. It can't hurt you if God has healed you. It can't hurt you if God has healed you. Uh, Proverbs 28, this is a powerful verse. This is the reason why we have small groups here at Discovery. I love this verse. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who conceals that situation or that issue or that past, that sin, I, I don't want to talk about it. No, I don't want to. He says, He who conceals it never prospers. You're never, gonna, you're never going to get ahead. You're never going to accomplish that hope and that future that God has for you. But he says, who, He who confesses and renounces them, finds mercy. I'm telling you, a lot, a lot of you are being haunted a lot by your past because you've never let the Holy Spirit heal you. You've never really dealt with it properly. Here's the second thing that a lot of people try to do, and this is a very twisted response. This is where you know the enemy is, is, is convincing you and, 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 and really twisting your thoughts in this area, and that is some of us just beat ourselves up about it. We, can, we, we tend to just beat ourselves. We blame ourselves. We, 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 you're such a fool, man. Oh, I messed up big time. I'm such a jerk. I'm a failure. And we just, we, oh, I'll never, I'll never get beyond this. Oh, my, my, my life is over. It's, and David, David had a similar issue where David, he's like the king. He's the friend of God. He writes psalms and all these things and worship. But he also had a dark past. He also struggled with some with some decisions he made, mistakes. He committed adultery with a woman. And then, and then he had that, the husband of that woman killed, okay? And so he had this dark past that he even struggled with, and he talks about it in Psalm 38. He says, I'm drowning in the flood of my sins. They are a burden too heavy to bear. Some of you know that feeling. You know exactly what he's talking about right there. He says, because I've been foolish, I'm utterly worn out and crushed man this this pressure is just crushing me my heart is troubled and some people some people believe that beating themselves up is their penance like it's their price to pay can i tell you something like about about god in this area god does not remind you of your sins so that you could be punished god doesn't do that okay this is going to be a revelation for some of you you need to understand this that's not god going just trying to put you in your place remember who you are that's not god god does not remind you of your sin god reminds you of your righteousness that's what god does god reminds you of your righteousness in christ he reminds you of what his son did for you and who you are in him not who you used to be i'm preaching yeah, three of you are responding but all right amen pastor jason i'm just going to get myself fired up right now here's number three Third thing we can do is we can blame others. We can blame others. And this one's tricky because sometimes you're like, but it is their fault. They hurt me. They, listen, it, this, this thing can manifest in a lot of different ways if you don't deal with it. For, let, me, let me give you an example. Say you get, you get a splinter in your finger, like it's a bad one, like it's a nasty splinter, big old splinter, okay? But you never deal with it. And it just gets swollen and nasty and infected and red. And it's just, it's just bad. It's bad. And, and, and so... You didn't deal with it, but just, it just so happened because it's going to happen. It's bound to happen. Someone is walking by you and brushes up against your finger, and what do you do? Why'd you do that to me? You hurt me. Why'd you, why'd you hurt me that way? When, in fact, did they really hurt you? 
No, they didn't hurt you. You just never dealt with that pain in your past that now it's manifesting in other areas of your life. And you're shifting blame over here like, oh, uh, if this is their fault, it's their fault. You hurt me and you're taking offense all over the place and you can't forgive people. You're bitter, you're bitter. Where is it coming from? It's not their fault. You just never dealt with the issue. And you start blaming others for your problems and for the pain. That's not really their problem. It's not really, the, and this whole blame thing has been going on from the beginning. Genesis 3.13, we see it show up when in the Garden of Eden when God is like asking David, and, or I'm sorry, uh, um, I said, they, um, Adam and Eve, like, where, where are they? Like, where, where you, you know, you know the story, they ate the apple, and Eve has a funny story. She doesn't take, take the, the blame for it. She doesn't take responsibility. She says, no, 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 the serpent deceived me. That's the devil's fault. Even Adam, Adam didn't take responsibility either. The Bible says Adam was standing by, but he says, God, it's your fault. You gave me her. That's what he said. He said, you gave me this woman. It's your fault, okay? You created her, God. You know, and so this blame thing has been going on forever. So what's the solution? Then? What is this, what, what, this fourth way that we can do, what we can do with our past, is what I kind of want to teach you today. And I want to kind of just kind of warn you up front, this is Christianese, okay? And I'm going to help you understand it a little bit. And I know sometimes preachers and pastors can be like, we can say things that maybe sound easy where, oh, you know, that sounds easy, but it's harder than that, okay? But this, I, I want to explain this to you, this fourth part here. Write it down. We need to believe God. That's what we need to do. We need to believe God because he sees your life differently than maybe you see it. He sees your past completely differently than possibly you are seeing it, but you don't believe it like you're, you're living, you're even sitting in church singing the songs and it's like you're dreaming, it's pretty and you can imagine it, but it doesn't really happen, at least not for you. Well, my job is if the enemy has sold you some lies and you're bought into some things that aren't really there. I mean, there's, not, it's, there's nothing in the living room, okay? There's no, there's no ghost that's there. You turn on the light, it's not, it's not there. If you've bought into that reality, then what I need to do and what God wants to do today is to have you buy into a new reality, is to get a new set of beliefs. Let me, let me tell you what God believes about you. And now this is, this is, this is what you need to buy into because you're letting your past haunt you because you've bought into some lies. Here's what God says. This is what God says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You ready to hear what God says about you? This is what he says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if, if anyone's a Christian, he's saying, he is a new creation and everything old has, say that word out loud, has, gone. it's gone. The new has come. It's gone. Okay, you keep having nightmares of the past, but there's nothing there. God says that is gone. It's not, it's not even present anymore. I have made you brand new. And listen to this. Not only do you have this hope in a future, like God has a new direction for your life, but he's actually rewritten your past. Do you know that? Like, yes, he has, he has a different narrative that you have. Like your narrative is one that gives you pressure and doubts and bitterness, but God's narrative on your history is different than the one you're reading. Look what Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 says. He says this, that the enemy, the devil, he says, you planned something bad for me. Like that tragedy was something bad and was planned something bad. Those mistakes that I made, those sins that I committed, Man, the devil had something planned bad for me, but God. Can someone say, but God? but God? But God produced something good from it. Something good came out of that tragedy. God rewrote it, man. It was a mistake. It was a sin. It was a pain. It was a wound. It was something that was hurting, but it's not that anymore in my life. God rewrote the script of my past and now turned into something good. So how do, we, how do we break free? How do we, how do, we do this? How do we change these, the, the, the belief, change our minds, untwist our thinking from the lies of the enemy about who we are and about our past and about what God says about us? How do we break free from the past once and for all? We need to do what Jeremiah says next. And honestly, it's one of the most beautiful verses in the entire Bible. I would just encourage you to commit this even to memory. He says this in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21 through 23. He says, even though I've remembered all these things in my past, God, 
yet this I call to mind. Look at this. And therefore, I have hope now. Yeah, I know, I know my past, but there, I have hope now because the Lord's great love for me. I know sometimes I don't feel like it, but really when I think about it, he does. Because the Lord's great love for me, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. Can you help me read this last part together? One, two, three. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Something has got to change in our beliefs. That we're being haunted by our past because it's not healed. And because we're not whole. So let me give you four steps on how to break free, how to experience healing and wholeness and break free from your past and never again be haunted from those ghosts again. Here it is. Write it down. Number one, you got to start here. Number one, we have to reject the lies of the enemy. So you got to be able to identify and reject those lies that he's speaking over your life, that you are not identified by your past. You are not defined by your past. Hey, listen, you're prepared by your past. That's what God does. God doesn't have it define you. He just has it prepare you for your destiny. you got to reject, identify and reject those lies. Don't buy into his reality and truths and falsehoods. How does the Bible say we do that? 2 Corinthians 10. Verse 4 through 5 uses this word stronghold. And a stronghold is a lie that a person is accepted as a truth. It's an area in our lives which we're held bondage by due to a certain way of thinking. And when we believe the devil's lie, we become a prisoner of deception. That's what the word stronghold means. It means a prisoner of deception. Look at this, 2 Corinthians. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power, man. I mean, there is a supernatural power that God has given us weapons to demolish deceptions of the enemy, lies of the enemy. That's what he's saying there. We demolish these arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Man, I got to reject those lies. Now, here's, the, here's, here's step number two. And it leads right into there because he says we need to take captive every thought and make it obedient. So here's number two. We've got to refocus our minds. We have to refocus our minds. You're going to have to decide that those, listen, you're going to have to make a decision today. Listen, that those past thoughts are not going to be the dominating thoughts of your life. You're going to have to stop allowing those to dominate your thinking. Like you keep replaying the resume of your past. You keep replaying the events, and if you desperately want to be free, you need to understand that everything begins with a thought. Everything begins. Romans 12 and 2 says, let God transform you to a new person. How? By changing the way you think. If you're going to grab hold of this freedom, you need to discipline your mind to think new thoughts. You say, Jason, where does that come from? Because, I mean, I remember well the pain, the hurt, the tragedy. How am I going to discipline my mind? I mean, I even have tried it. Can I tell you the secret here? This is why we read the Word of God every day. That's why we read the Word and meditate on the Word of God every day to get God's thoughts in. Listen, in, in, in Bible reading, we don't read the Bible every day to finish our chapter, to click that button and do my devotion or, or to read through the Bible in a year. That's not the why of reading your Bible. Let me give you the real why. This should be your why of why you read the Bible, to grab hold of the Spirit of God, to grab hold of the truth of just one truth, and to hold on to that truth and to make it your dominating thought all day. That's why I read, I read the one-year Bible, it's what I, it's, but I don't read it to just read the Bible every year. I read it to grab hold. In today's, in today's devotion, I grabbed, I grabbed hold of 1 John 4.4, 4. and he says, you're an overcomer. You've already overcome, he said. Because because greater is he that is in you than the one who's in the world. And I've just been holding on to that, this thought, and I've been even praying about it. I said, God, the spirit that you've given me, the spirit that you've given your church is greater than he that's in the world. It's greater than their past. It's greater than their problems. It's greater than their pains and their mistakes and their failures. Greater is you that's in us than he that's in the world. And you grab hold of, what would your life look like if you just grabbed one God thought a day? Just one fresh God thought, and you let that dominate your thinking all 
day. You know what happened? You'd have a renewed mind. You'd have, you'd have a renewed mind. And for, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, says that this is the reason why many people are far away from God. Many are far away from the life God of God because they shut their minds against him. You say, man, I try. I go to church. I try. I try. Well, well the reason why God feels maybe so far away is because he's not the dominating thought. We shut our minds against God, and they can't understand his ways. I'm telling you, I, if I can convince you of one thing today is to, to, to get into your word and buy into the truth of God's word. It's, I'm telling you, it's trustworthy. God is worthy of your trust. His word is worthy of your trust, and let it dominate your thinking. I woke up early this morning. I just prayed this verse for you. I put it in your notes already. Ephesians 3.18, this has been on my thoughts all day, all morning. He says that you, this is a prayer Paul prayed for the Ephesian church, that you may have the power to understand. Man, that's my prayer for you today, that you would just, light bulb, come on. I said, wow, I get it. Oh man, the light just came on. This is what I hope you get, that you understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high and how deep his love really is. In other words, that God really does love you. I know you have a bad resume. I know you have mistakes and issues of your past. I know that you've had tragedies and experiences, but God loves you. So much he loves you. So much more, he says, you won't even really be able to fully understand it. That's my prayer for you, to get your minds focused on that truth here's the third thing that we need to do in order to break free from our past and that is number three and this one's hard but you just got to trust me in this trust god in this you got to release your past you got to let it go you have to release those things we have to actively get rid of the ghosts of our past and stop letting our resumes define us we got to get to a place where you trust god with it and when you do that your past no longer defines you that's when your past begins to prepare you by not releasing it, you give power to it. And this is why people don't release the people that have hurt them, have offended them. Because somehow we've been convinced, and this is the enemy now, has convinced us that by forgiving, somehow I'm giving power away. That I'm putting power in their hands now. And that's a lie. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what God says. That is not the truth. By not releasing them, you are giving the power to that person, to the hurt, to the circumstance. Listen, forgiveness is self-empowerment forgiveness empowers self when you hold on to bitterness you keep the power away from you so when you release the past what that is doing is taking the power back it's taking the power back in your life you got to release those things isaiah says it this way forget the former things don't dwell on the past i mean you got to understand this miracle did you know that god just doesn't forgive you um, like he didn't just come, Jesus didn't come just to, you know, take your problems and forgive you for it. Like, well, there, there they are, but you're forgiven. I mean, they're right there, but, but, but you're forgiven. That's not what he does. He came to do something greater. He came not only to forgive you, but to cleanse you from them, to remove the stain, the shame, the guilt, to make your life like it never happened. He came to set you free, to redeem you, to release you. And that's what the Bible says in Psalm 103. He says, he does not treat us as our sins deserve. Aren't you glad for that? That God doesn't treat, give us what we deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. But instead, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from, uh, from in one place, it says that he remembers them no more. You know what that means? That's a complete do-over. You get a fresh start. You're hiding in your bed full of shame, fear, and regret. And God is going, it's not there. There's nothing haunting you. It's gone. I removed it. If you just would buy into my truth of what I see about you. I love how Micah says it. Micah 7 verse 18. We sang about this verse this morning. You'll see it in here. He says, who is God like you? Man, God, when you... There's no one like you who pardons sins and forgives the transgressions of your people. You don't stay angry forever, but you delight to show mercy. I mean, it, you, he delights. 
to let you off the hook. He delights to wash away your sin. He delights, he enjoys taking your shame, your guilt, your mistakes, your pains, and your past and going, it's gone. I don't see it anymore. It's not a part of you anymore. It's not, it's, you don't have to carry it anymore. It doesn't have to haunt you anymore. That's the kind of God you serve, that he enjoys letting us off the hook of even the things that we've done to ourselves. So you want to be free? You want to break free from your past? You got to reject the lies of the enemy. That's number one. Secondly, you have to change the way we think. We're going to receive this great forgiveness. Then there's got to be this release, thirdly, of our past. Then God wants to do this brand new work. He wants to take you to a new place. Write it down like this. He wants to renew your heart. He wants to renew it. He wants to do something new inside of your heart. And some of you, look, some of you, sometimes we think of this, you, you have a picture of a heart, right? And this, you ever seen the heart and it has that little Band-Aid on it? Yeah, it's like, oh, I've been, God has healed me. God, that's not the picture of God. God says he wants to give you a new heart. He doesn't want to bandage it and patch you up. And No, 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 that's not what the Bible says. Ezekiel 36, 26, he says it this way. I will give you a new heart. I'm not going to let that thing be wounded. I'm not going to let the past and your regrets and your shames cloud that thing and for you to have to build protective walls around it because of your past. No, no, no. I want to give you a new heart and I'm going to put a new spirit in you. And I'll remove all of your past, all the stuff that hardened your heart, all the hurt, all those mistakes. I'll remove that heart of stone, he said. I not only want to give you a new heart, but I'll take your past, your shame, your regret, I'll take it away. If I'm going to make you, he says, a brand new person. Let's do that together. Come on, all across the worship center. Let's bow our heads. God wants to do something new in your life, in your heart today. Some of you here today, you need this. You're being haunted by your past. And, and for some reason, in this season, it kind of just comes up more. Some of you have experienced some tragedies that no one should have to experience. No one should have to feel what you felt, go through what you went through. And I'm not making any excuses about it, it was wrong and it hurt. But because maybe you haven't dealt with it and let God heal it, it's still hurting you today. And it's filling you with doubt and distrust. Or maybe you're here today and it's your own personal failures, mistakes you've made, sins you've committed. That, that yeah, God has forgiven you. And you hear the Bible and you hear the message. And it's like, yeah, that's a great message. But you're having a hard problem letting yourself off the hook. Of buying into God's word and how he sees you and your mistakes in your past. And so you're filled with, with just this, this bitterness or maybe you're here today and you have this relational wounds. You've been hurt and you've never dealt with them, truly never received healing. And instead of burying it and beating yourself up and blaming others, today, in Jesus' name, I declare right now, come on church, I declare God that we are putting our trust in you, that we are gonna believe what you say about us, God. That in Christ, I am a new creation. Come on, church, will you declare that right now? In Christ, I am a new creation that the old things have passed away. They are gone. Behold, I am made new in you, Christ. I am brand new, a clean slate, a fresh start. A new heart and a new spirit is inside of me. Maybe you're here today and maybe you want that. You kind you of... You can't quite say that, that you are in Christ. And let me tell you what that means. That just means that you put your faith in him, that you put your life in his hands, that you've surrendered the control to him. That is those who are in Christ. And you can do that right now. You, the good news is, look, the good news is, is that you, you, you don't have to do anything. You can't clean up yourself. You cannot, you cannot clean the past and remove the stain. And that's actually the bad news. <laughs> Good news is you don't have to. God doesn't want you to. He sent his son, Jesus, to do it for you. And the way you do that is you put your life in his hands. 
Surrender it to him. Make Jesus your Lord. So if you're here today and you want that, you want to be in Christ. With every head bowed and eye closed, come on, church. Maybe you're here and you want that. I want to pray for you right now. Make that decision right now. Can you just begin to make that decision in your hearts between you and God? God, I need you. I want to be in Christ. I want you. I need you, God. If you're here today and that's you, I'm not going to call you up to the front. I'll single you out in any way. I want to pray a prayer of just surrender, of just giving the control of your life to God right now. Come on, if that's you, will you lift up your hand, lift it high. So that's me. Come on, pastor, pray for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen, amen. Leave it up. Yes, 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 yes. Keep it up all over. Yeah, amen. Praise God. Yes. Go ahead and put your hands down. Pray like this. Just say, Jesus, forgive me. Oh, I need a fresh start. So today... I surrender my life to you, and I give you the control. Come give me a new heart and a new spirit. Help me to live for you, God. Today, Jesus, I accept your forgiveness. I accept a clean slate that the past is gone, and I'm made new right now. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you for your mercy, God. God, I speak that over every person right now, that they would walk out of here free, that those, the bondage and the stronghold and the deception of the enemy broken in Jesus' name, that the past cannot haunt us anymore, but we are going to be free and free indeed. Thank you, God, for your work in our life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today, amen. We are so thankful for all God is doing in and through your life, and we would love to continue helping you on your journey. To find out what your next steps are in your relationship with Christ, go to ilovediscovery.church forward slash next dash steps. At Discovery Church, it's our mission to teach people to love God passionately, love each other authentically, and change the world for the cause of Christ. And that mission drives everything we do as a church. Join us next week for part two of Ghost of Christmas Past.